Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for coming, um, joining us tonight to hear Miro Kasumi speak about his work. Tonight, we're celebrating the opening of his new project called Battlelands, which is presented in the Bank of America Gallery downstairs, um, which is um, being presented with additional support from the Knight Foundation. And this is um, a, a commissioned project um, that um, I've been working on for a couple years with Miro. Let me introduce him, and then I just want to talk a little bit about his work and um, how our conversation has developed. But um, <coughs> um, my name is Tobias Ostrander. I'm the chief curator and deputy director here at PAM, if we don't know each other. Um, so Miro Kasumi uh, is, is um, from Japan. He works uh, um, outside of Tokyo. He, he attended the International Christian University in Tokyo and then the Chelsea College of Art and Design in London, as well as the Rijks Academy in, in Amsterdam. He's had many solo exhibitions, including at his gallery, Annette um, Gelling Gallery in, in Amsterdam in 2007, um, at the Caddist Art Foundation in Paris in 2014. He had a very important show at the Museum of Modern Art um, in, in New York in 2013, as well as at the Centro de Arte de Cajas de Burgos um, in 2012 at the art space in Sydney as well. He's um, been in group exhibitions, the Ex um, Experimenta's Fifth International Biennial, uh, Biennial of Media Art in Melbourne in 2014, um, a, a collective show at the Tokyo Opera um, City Art Gallery in 2014, um, among others. You know, the, he's been at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Tokyo, Liverpool Biennial in 2010, um, Shanghai Mocha in, in Shanghai in 2008. His, his work is um, in the collections of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, as well as the Caddis Foundation in Paris and the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam. Um, just a little bit of my own um, experience or getting to know uh, Miro's work. Um, when we opened, the, when we were planning the opening of the building here, the first large exhibition that we presented um, was of the Chinese artist Ai Weiwei. And that, um, that exhibition was, was curated by an incredible curator named Mame Kataoka, who works at the Mori Art Museum. And Miro has also shown at the Mori Art Museum in Japan, uh, a, a very important institution there. And so in planning that exhibition, um, I went to Japan to work with the curator on our way to, to China to meet with Ai Weiwei. And, and Mami, the curator, suggested that I meet a few artists while I was there. And, and um, Mira was one of the artists that I met, and I, I knew his work a little bit. Um, I had seen it in a couple exhibitions, but that started a conversation that has really led up to this project today. Um, and I saw his work um, a lot. He'll go through tonight um, some of his previous work, and we'll see it here on the screen, but a lot of his, his works are um, particularly his early works, are really meant to be seen in, in an installation setting. They're multi-channel, or, or they work with the viewer's body in, in very distinct ways. Um, but, you know, Miro's work is, is, is incredibly um, thoughtful and, and aggressive at the same time. He goes very, very deep into the subjects he's working with. And um, up until now, his, his focus has primarily been um, the Japanese context of which he's from, and looking into histories there, um, using um, you know various subjects to explore the military histories in 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 Japan um, and kind of personal histories of of trauma in different ways, and he'll 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 go into that further. This is the first project that he's done um, with with non-Japanese subjects, so. Um, and it, it's really responding to our invitation at PAM to come and, and explore this context of Miami and, and what, what he might explore in, in this US um, cultural context. And, and, um, and it's very interesting and very, I think, um, coherent in his practice to move from these military histories of Japan um, into a US context and, and think about the differences and, and bring it up to a very contemporary conversation of what it means to be a soldier um, today. Um, and 
I would encourage people, the, the, the exhibition comes with a brochure and um, normally the, the brochures have a curatorial essay. Normally I write the essays for the shows I'm working on. But Miro wrote such a thoughtful um, reflection on his, his project and really contextualizing it in such an interesting way in our conversations um, that I thought it was really appropriate to have, have him speak in his own words about the project. So it's a beautiful text about you know, what this project means um, to him and, and, and his work in general. But um, please help me welcome Miro to the stage and um, I look forward to the conversation this evening. We'll have questions afterwards as well. Thank you. Good evening. <coughs> Thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity, uh, Tobias and all, all the people from Paris Art Museum, to give me this wonderful opportunity to talk about uh, my first to make my work and present it, and now talk about my work in this beautiful museum. And thank you very much for your time to come to uh, here. Uh, yes, as, as uh, Tobias uh, told, that I was invited to come here more than two years ago to make a project and it's been it's been a very long process to to be here and finally I'm, I'm so glad that I'm here and I'm now I'm talking about this artwork and so uh, yes as Tobias said this is first time for me to make artwork up around this issue ar around this topic outside of Japan and and uh, but first I want to say like how close we are in, in, in everyday life, how close we are to the US uh, uh, military. Uh, I'm living in Japan, Yokohama, uh, which is so just south of Tokyo, and we, I'm taking my kids, five year, I have a five-year-old kid, and I'm taking him to daycare every day. And we walk every day, and then every day we hear this, like, you know, this uh, jet, uh, how do I say, jet, uh, it's, it's a, um, U.S. A Air Force. Uh, it's taking off every day and uh, against the beautiful Mount Fuji. <laughs> it's a very typical image of, of Japan for me. It's like this beautiful Mount Fuji and then this U.S. Uh, you know, military uh, Air Force a airplane goes and helicopter goes. <laughs> yeah, that's like my everyday life. So uh, we feel very close actually and it's there but we yeah, so that's like a, where, where, I'm, where I live and where I come from. And, that's, and I, I've been making work about, uh, about these issues in, Japan, in Japanese context. Till 2007, I've been living outside of Japan quite often. And, uh, and uh, when you are living outside of your own country, you think, about, uh, you think a lot about your own context, your country. So I was living in London, I was living in Canada, I was living in uh, Amsterdam, and then I was looking at other society, like uh, from different society from what I'm, where I come from, and I was thinking a lot about like what is Japan, why I'm Japanese. I always have carry, I always carry my passport. Why am I Japanese? So in 2007, I was go gonna go back to Japan, and I thought, okay, I'm gonna stay there for a while and just question myself, what is what is state? What is nation? What is Japan? And all these questions, it's a big question, I know, but it's very important. It's a very personal question, too. And it's a very important question. Yeah, it's, very, it's, a, it's a big question, but it's very personal. And I don't have an answer. I carry my passport. But I didn't choose to be Japanese, but uh, probably I try hard. I can change my nationality. But still, a lot of like, Japanese-ness is within me. The culture is within me. And also, I speak this uh, Japanese language. So I was. I started to question. Okay, why am I Japanese? Why? Why not uh, other? Other? And why? Wh what is this nation? What is this state? What? What? What are they doing to me? And so I'm gonna have. I try to come up with some sort of answer through making artwork. So that's what I've been doing since 2007. And in the Japanese context, uh, one of the thing that I one of the thing that I hit one of the th theme that I hit was kamikaze. This like. Uh, yeah, uh, this uh, suicidal uh, uh, pilot who had to kill themselves 
uh, towards the end of the World War II, and they, yeah, it's like they, they sacrificed their lives for the, for the state. And, uh, and it was like an ultimate question, like whether can you die for the state? Can you die for the country? Can you die for the, you know, the nation? Probably if I ask these questions, I've been asking these questions to a lot of people actually lately, and people say, yeah, oh, for, personally, I can die for my son. Yeah, of course, why I have to, if I have to protect him, probably I, I, I do it. But can I die for my family? Probably, I hope so. But it, then how far can you extend that? You know, can you die for your neighbor? Probably I cannot. But if you have very close neighborhood, then probably some people say yes. I was, in, I, I was just in Paris and I was asking young people the same question and they say they can die for their mother. You know, this is like very culture. It was a suburb of Paris, and uh, but the, probably nobody in Japan now today say that I can die for my my mother. You know, so it's a it's a cultural thing, I think. But uh, you know, how far, where is the boundary? You know, and then these people uh, towards the World War Two, uh, these young people, they decided, okay, I can die for the state. So they did it, and probably it was a wartime. So many people had the, the similar kind of uh, uh, decision, made the decisions. But if today, yes, my question is like, okay, if something happened, can I be a kamikaze? Can I be a kamikaze pilot? I had no, an, uh, no answer. I, I was like, oh, I'm not quite sure. So let's find out. So I've been working on this uh, topic for the for, for last, uh, let's say, 10 years. And this is one of the first work that I made on the topic, and I don't, yeah, today I will try to show one, two, three, three previous works and one new work. So um, I, I, I hope, I, I wish I can show the whole thing, but I don't have time for it. So I just show s some parts of it to, to, uh, to, to explain. Okay, so this is, this work is called uh, Portrait of Young Samurai, and it's made in 2009. お父様、お母様、長い間、どうもありがとうございました。いよいよ次期です。こんなに名誉ある死に場所が与えられて、僕は本当に幸せ者です。お国のために立派に死んでまいりますので。どうか成功をお祈りしていてください末永くお元気でさよならあの侍魂みたいな強さなんですかそっちを意識して感情のレベルは今でいいんですけれどもそこに侍魂的な強さを最後はもう一回お願いしますお父様お母様長い間どうもありがとうございましたいよいよ出撃ですこんなに名誉ある死に場所がいただけて僕は本当に幸せ者です国のために一般に死んでまいりますのでどうか成功をお祈りしていてください末永くお元気でさよなちょっともう行っちゃってるくらい侍魂ですか侍になってみてくださいまだ普通の人なんでねここに立ってるのはまだ普通の役者さんが
express it. So I'm, I'm, I'm playing the director who is never so he has to do it more and more. So the whole day he has to do it. And this is this is that still beginning. So I give him like direction and he has to interpret and he has to play it and it gets more もっとです。もっともっともっと。お国のためにもう一度はい、はい、ちょっと待ってもう一方今まだまだまだそこにいるもっと向こうに行っちゃっていいもっと腹の底にあるその侍魂をもう吐き出す感じでお父様お母様長い間ありがとうございました。出撃です。このような目ある。知りましょう。あたたい待って。お父様。お母様。長い間どうもありがとうございました。いよいよ出撃です。thing is like uh, nine minutes and uh, and it's now I usually show it with a four screens so it's it's a it's quite uh, overwhelming uh, setting and so uh, with this work the samurai I the word samurai we use it still in Japan we use it in everyday context for example national football team is called samurai blue or national baseball team is called uh, samurai Samurai Japan. So this is like a kind of magical word that is like around, around uh, it's a magical word in Japan and it kind of shows like it's brave and it's, you know, it's, it's uh, brave, yeah, it's brave and it's, it's, uh, it has like this dignity and all that. So it, they, we use this term, but nobody use it like uh, with understanding of what this word really is. And samurai is just a, you know, it's just war, it means like a, like a warrior. And it used, historically, it used to be just a class, class in, 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 a, in a society where people had to fight with, with sword and, and with armor. That's samurai. It's like knight in the European context, samurai. But from 1600 to 1860, we had this peaceful time, and samurai was the, 
the class, that upper class, who, who were like bureaucrats they, with, a, with a sword. And during this time, we didn't have any war inside or we were not attacked by any other countries. So it was like peaceful time. And during these 2,300 uh, years, samurai became kind of aestheticized. So it became like a, a code, like moral code for these uh, upper class people. So that they, it's not a matter of whether they, were, they had to train, of course, how to use the sword. But at the same time, they kind of created a moral code or like code for the everyday life, what they have to do, how, how they have to serve, you know, the, the, the master. And during the, in this process of uh, aesthetization of samurai, the, 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 the samurai, things like, you know, dine became romanticized. So it was like beautiful to die. Well, it was very noble to die as a samurai. So all these things were like kind of, uh, became a co moral code for, moral code for like, for the, this class. And from 1860, we start to become our um, modernized country. Japan become, start to become a modernized country. And then in this process of modernization, this word samurai or this like ethical code of samurai was, kind of reinvented, and then they were put in, into a new, like, modernized uh, system of Japan, and it became a moral code for, for the soldiers, for the state. And so the kamikaze pilot, they were, of course, they were on the, on the airplane, but they all had sword. They don't, of course, they don't, they don't use the sword to, to, to you know, to, to be a pilot, but they, they carry the sword. It's a, it's a symbolic thing. And so this, like, a the samurai spirit or like, you know, samurai way of life, it became, uh, ide uh, ide uh, uh, it became an ideology for a militaristic uh, uh, system of, of a modernized Japan. And then through this, many people, like, uh, it was like 5,000, five, is it 5,000? 5,000, yes, 5,000 young people died in the, uh, in the kamikaze mission uh, in, from like a beginning of, let's say, beginning of 1945 till the August of 1945. So in, in short period of time, 5,000 people, young people had to kill themselves in, in this mission. And this is like, yeah, it's a big failure for me. I, 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 I believe that it's a big, big failure. Uh, but uh, some people think that, of course, it's a, it's a pride of Japan and they, they died for Jap Japan and they, we are so proud of it. It's always debate whether you're proud of it or you sh feel shame of it. And it's always a question whether these young people were ordered to kill themselves or they had they volunteer to kill themselves. It's a big question. And from, for some people, they volunteer to kill themselves to save the, to protect the, the, the country and to protect you and to, to protect your uh, family. They diet, they volunteer to do it. So they are the national hero, heroes, and they have to be, uh, they have to be, uh, you know, they, they, they have to be worshipped. That's one way of looking at. Another way of looking at is no, 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 no. Their death were just wasted, was, wasted death, and we call it dog death. So they were like just wasted, and it's just tragedy. There's nothing to be proud of. It's just big failure. And we just have to feel sorry for these young people and try not to repeat it again. That's another way of, if I simplify it, that's another way of saying it. And, but people usually don't have clear idea of, the personal idea of what it, what it is. But during the wartime, they were war heroes. They were national heroes. So they were, during the wartime, they were like, wow, you are doing, doing this? And the people were very proud of you. And they were, they were very proud of themselves, of course. Otherwise, it, it couldn't happen. So during the wartime, they were heroes. But as soon as war finished, they became a criminal. They became a like, ultra-nationalist. Uh, and they had to hide themselves because they thought Americans would come and they would be taken away and they would be executed. So they had to hide from, from eyes. So uh, these people like Kamikaze, yes, we have, we have many people called failed kamikaze. So since I was making a, a like, series of work up on this issue, I th knew that I, well, I, it's, it's, it was like my almost my mis responsibility to make a work with a failed kamikaze pilot. 
Why did they fail? Because we, have, we had so many failed kamikaze pilots. It was towards the, the, the war end of the World War II, and it was towards the end, so we didn't have enough fuel to fill in, in the gas. We didn't have enough fuel, fuel, and also we didn't have enough steel to make new airplane. And by the time, American had much better airplane, so uh, it was like, a, uh, so there many people failed. So, so uh, some people got just sh uh, you know, shot down, or some other people didn't even reach to, to the American battleship. So that's like, uh, so we had many failed kamikaze pilots, and I made one, uh, I, yeah, I made one work with uh, one of the failed kamikaze pilots. I just show it briefly. So his name is Mr. Itazu. It took me for a while to find somebody uh, who is okay to do a project with me, but he was he was he was he was a fantastic person. Um, I I had to spend quite a long time actually convince him to <laughs> do it. You know, this is a very Japanese way. I, every time he does a public talk and he's, he he talks about the uh, kamikaze about his experience to the public, and and so. Uh, I go to his talk and I, every time I ask him, okay, can we make something together? And he said, oh, I'm busy, uh, he's, he's busy, uh, he was old already, and I'm busy, uh, or he would say, ah, oh, I have another lecture in coming month and I have to prepare. So I said, okay, I'll, okay, I'll come back, I'm back, I'm back. And so I would keep on coming back to his lecture, and, but it, uh, after I, we made the work, he said, he was saying no to me, you know, but he doesn't say no to directly, but, so uh, anyway, anyway, uh, in the end, he said, why not? So we made work. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's true, yeah. So first, he talked about his experience. Well, I, yeah, I cannot show the whole thing, so I just explained. So he volunteered to become a kamikaze pilot. He wanted to become a kamikaze pilot, and he volunteered to do it, and and he took off with his 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 uh, his team and but he had a problem with the engine and then he luckily he found an island so he crashed around it on the island and he survived but he felt so sorry for you know all the other people had died so he went back to his base and he begging he had to beg he begged like i want to do it again i want to do it again and he got two more uh, order to take off, but then it, 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 it just rained and it postponed, and then the war ended. So he survived. That's how he survived. He explain, He talks about this experience, and then he said. Uh, uh, then I asked him, please pick one friend that he wants to talk to from his 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 uh, team, and he picked Mr. Ashida. He's, he was a best friend. And he said, Mr. Ashida is the best friend and he, I want to talk to him. So I asked him to hold a photo of Mr. Ashida and I asked him to talk to Mr. Ashida. That's the first part of this video. Oh. <laughs> もう、あれから67年も経つ。今日この私の、え、居住作の犬山で、え、君の、え、写真を見ながら、ま、こうやって語って、あの、いるわけなんですが、ま、あの、
それを読んで見ることによって心がいやちょっと休まるような気がする。もうあれから67年も経つあってやな今日この私の居住先の犬山で君の写真を見ながら今こうやって語っているわけなんですがまああの。芦田君をいくらあの見つけようと思っておうちの方も聞いたんですが、うん、君の書いたもの残された衣装は何一つ現れなかった、うん、それが何か、えー、心残るというか、えーえー、のそれを読んで見ることによって、うん、心がいやちょっと休まるような気がするんですがそういうことも現在あのやることができない今立場にあるわけなんですがこの写真だけでもと思ってもう今あのここで眺めているわけなんです。そうかまあえーまあ、あのいたつ残念だったなあのの当時特攻隊で67年もお前と一緒にこう知覧へ行って出撃しする気持ちその時は本当に何という気持ちであったかもうお国のためにという自分たちはこれはやらなければ絶対あの日本の今度本土の方にはかわいい妹や弟そしてお父さんたち身内の方がおられその人たちの少しでもこの攻撃が受けられないような状態に君も俺もやるつもりでこう、えー、そうだな。喜びさんで出撃して行ったんですが、案に反して私はこのこのようなふうに生きてしまった。本当にあの申し訳ないというか、あの私のこの今のこの生きたことを許していただきたいと思ってます。この。俺は卒業するとこは成功したけどお前は運が悪かったな飛行機が途中で止まってしまったんだ、まあ、そうだな、えー、明日君もう。So、uh, every time he does a public talk he always say I should not have survived I'm, I feel so sorry I so feel sorry that I survived and it's very painful to hear this he has to keep on he has to keep he, he has to say this for last like 70 years he has to keep on saying in public that i should not have survived i should have died i feel so sorry that i survived and he has to say that in in the public he can never say i'm happy i i survived i'm you know this uh, failed kamikaze like i learned so much from mr itazu and he said uh, no uh, i it seems like he's he's uh, suffered from two two emotions one is like guilt He promised with, with, with his people, that he, with his uh, uh, friends, that he, they'll die together. But he survived. He's the only one who survived. So he feels so guilty towards the others. And then also a shame. He thinks that people think that he's a coward. Nobody thinks that he, he, because he's a kamikaze pilot, he's a brave, most brave person, we think. But he thinks that people think that he's, he couldn't accomplish it because he, he was afraid. To kill himself. Nobody would think that, but that's his anxiety. So he was suffered, these people suffered from、uh, guilt and shame. And, 
and uh, yeah, so uh, the, so many people didn't talk about their experience, but he, the way he deal with this to emotion was he he talked it he talked about it in publicly. So uh, so that that's him, and then through him he always stressed a point that we volunteered, we did it. We wanted to do it. We did it for our family, our friends, our you know sister and brother. And, and, you know, we we wanted to save the country, so that's why we did it. And no, no, nobody in his in team said, was was ordered to do it. We volunteered to do it. So uh, then I came to realize that okay, uh, there's a, as I said, there's a debate about whether they are ordered or they uh, uh, or they volunteer, and it seems like. This is like my interpretation. Uh, if you look at the, the history book, they say in some unit you had a choice. You know, you had a choice of whether you volunteer or you don't volunteer. And pe other people say, hey, no, no, there's no other choice. Like uh, they have to say that they volunteer. You know, there's a lot of debates on this. But I realize, I, this is my interpretation, that as experience, for the experience of the soldier, for the experience of the pilot, it had to be volunteer because they killed themselves for, for, for this mission. So as an experience, for their experience, I volunteered to kill, kill myself. That's, that's their experience, first-hand experience. And it has to be like this, otherwise this, uh, it doesn't function. This uh, whole um, uh, mission doesn't function. So th they volunteered to kill themselves. So that's, that's, I'm sure, I don't know, uh, that's I think. But also, if we look at this choice, personal choice, from the perspective that, of course, it's, it's, uh, it's conditioned. This, their choice is already conditioned from the beginning. Because, it's, uh, it's, of course, it's uh, during the wartime, they were educated, killed themselves for the, to, to serve for the emperor, and they killed themselves for the emperor. They were educated from, from the young age like that. And also, this is a military uh, situation. Of course, they have to follow the order, and if order is given, they have to interpret it, the, the order, and they have to take it into, into their own choice. So making choice is not like, just like I, I think I do it and uh, you do it, but making choice is like, a, it's a, it's a multi, 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 it's, it has a lot of layers, and as, so as an experience, my experience, I choose to, you know, <laughs> choose a Coke. <laughs> but of course, it, I, the reason why I choose a Coke is, of course, it's conditioned by, by the culture and by probably the TV and adverter, adverts. It's the same thing. So, uh, so that's how I, I, okay, I realized that, okay, they made the soldiers, the pilots, they made, they volunteered to do, do it. But also at the same time, it's this choice was already conditioned from the, the culture. As I said, it's, we have this uh, ideology of samurai and death, dying, killing yourself was, was romanticized. It's, it's a romantic. People, uh, the young people uh, of, uh, of this generation, they wanted to, you know, it was romantic to kill themselves for a big cause. And that was like part of the culture. Uh, we have like a culture of harakiri, it's a samurai, if they make a mistake or they dishonor uh, the name of the samurai, then they have to, you know, kill themselves uh, by cutting their uh, stomach. And that, uh, through the ritual. So that was like very much, we already had very uh, aestheticized uh, and romanticized uh, notion of death. So that was already there. So, so people wanted to die for, for the country. But of course, that's, as soon as war is finished, we are like, oh, that was crazy, you know. So uh, that's, that was like something that we, I learned so much from the, these uh, kamikaze pilots and these projects. And through making this project, uh, I interviewed like old people. I interviewed quite a lot of old people. And somehow I start to realize that th these videos are never enough. You know, if I, when I interview somebody in person, this experience of hearing this story from this person is always so much more rich, like much richer, and it's much, uh, you know, it's, m it's more, you know, heartbreaking, it's more emotional. It's always this through, you know, this experience. You can, I, and if I, as soon as I use camera, it's, it's, it's gone. So uh, I, I was very frustrated. For example, I had this experience of interviewing uh, 
86-year-old woman. She lost her boyfriend in the kamikaze. And uh, so I, she invited to her house, and I, I, I went there to hear her story. And eight hours, she talked about her experience without stop and without taking water. I was like, oh, is, are you OK? Are you, are you sure you, you, you don't want to take a water? And she's like, no, 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 no. And she was kept on going on and on for eight hours. And her story goes everywhere, <laughs> from now to then. And she talks about uh, my, uh, father, father. But I'm not quite sure which father she meant. So it's, it's very chaotic. Her story was very, very chaotic. But you know, she, in these eight hours, she kept on going back to one story. And every time she goes back to this story, same story, uh, so you feel like, oh, okay, that's the same story. But then every time she goes back to this same story, she adds something. So after eight hours hearing the same story, you know, four or five times, finally you realize what this story is all about. So every time, it was like an experience of hearing this story and then it is like rewritten the story again and again. And in the end, I get the whole picture and I was like, oh, Wow, that was, that was like, a, wow, that's a very hard story. But that, that's the kind of the experience that I get from interviewing these people. And this kind of uh, experience is never delivered in this like, two-dimensional framed video and you just watch them talking. No, it's like a, it's, it can only happen in this, this relationship. So I was frustrated, and but still I cannot give up uh, because I make this video. I try to you know, do it somehow in not direct way, but maybe I have to come up with some other way to deliver the story in, uh, yeah, that fits in this uh, media. So I want to show one more work, my older work. It's called uh, Trapped Wars, and this is something that I made in my home home hometown. Um, he's, uh, he, his, his name is Mr. Harada. Mr. Harada is 70, uh, at the time, he was 77 year old. So, like, uh, when he was seven year old, he, he he's my from my home. My hometown was bombed. Uh, to a very to, like ten days before the, the end of the war. This is what happened. Uh, so, towards the end of the war, now Americans could come to Japanese. You know, uh, you know, we didn't have any power to uh, strike back. So it was like an uh, American they have like B-29. They come to every city and they bombed every city. And they knew that, uh, you know, they spread, actually they spread paper before. Before spreading, uh, dropping the bomb. They, you, I don't know how you say this. <laughs> but uh, they, I, I, I feel more comfortable they say they. <laughs> they spread the paper saying that, okay, you, you'll be bombed. Go away, get out of the city. That's the, yes. So they have spread a lot of paper on the, but but Japanese people they are not allowed to pick up the paper. If they are found picking up the paper, then they'll be taken away by the police, and they'll be asked, "Why did you pick up? Are you a spy?" That's like that's a, how things work. And then the government, of course, knew that we were going to be bombed. The whole city is going to will be bombed. So they created many uh, bomb shelters and good bomb shelters to protect people. So they built so many bomb shelters, but what actually happened is like many people died in the bomb shelter. What happened is like uh, Japanese houses are made out of wood and paper. And when, when Americans dropped the bomb and they also dropped uh, like uh, some sort of uh, uh, like a napalm, so that, the, that creates the fire and whole city get, get burned. And when people were in these bomb shelters, it was like bomb shelters surrounded by the fire. And it became like an oven. And many people just cooked in, 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 in this oven and died. So same thing happened to Mr. Harada. He was seven year old. He was, yeah. He was seven year old. And, like, and he was in front of his house was a best bomb shelter, biggest bomb shelter in the town. And when, so when the bombing started, his parents put him in the shelter. And then many people went into the shelter and his parents couldn't get in because it was too full. And then, then people just died in there. 
But luckily, he was a small child. So he said, this lady, he, he doesn't know who, the, who this lady was. But the lady just, you know, covered her body to protect him. And, and he survived. And that's, that's his story. And he, for a long time, he couldn't speak about this experience because, it's, of course, it's too traumatic. But last, only last 10 years that he realized that, OK, no, there's nobody speaks about, who can speak about this kind of story anymore. And he felt like it's necessary to talk, tell his experience. So he started to do, like, do a public talk about his experience. And every time I hear it, it's, it's very painful, of course. It's very painful. And he, has, he saw something that you know, nobody should have, sh should have seen it. No, what he, no human should have experienced. He's experienced that. But, and how, so th this is like a, so I asked him to make a work with him. And he said, yeah, of course, it's okay. So we try, this is what we tried. これ。どうかかないよ。随分人が入ってきた。次から次と入ってきた。おい。坊主、ちょっと他適切な自分嫌だったな。ドーン。そう、こんな
大丈夫かよあんな中逃げてって空襲も始まってんだぞ熱い熱い。なんだこれ、これ火の声じゃねえか、冗談じゃねえよ、こんな熱い、こんな熱い中、火の声じゃねえよ、こんな熱い中、火の声じゃねえよ、こんな熱い中、火の声じゃねえよ、こんな熱い中、火の声じゃねえよ、こんな熱い中、火の声じゃねえよ、こんな熱い中、火の声じゃねえよ、こんな熱い中、火の声じゃねえよ、こんな熱い中、火の声じゃねえよ、こんな熱い中、火の声死んじまったってどこに逃げるいいんだよ。Yeah. So, yeah, you, I I I I I I おばちゃん、おばちゃん、おばちゃん、おばちゃん、助けてくれよ。ああ、そうですね。But yeah, it's, I, I, I move on. So, this is the kind of thing that I've been making in a Japanese context. And these are the things that, for example,、uh, yeah, talking about experience, it's, yeah, it's, we're our brain. I understand that our, our, through working with him, you know, I understand that brain is never, it's not, it's not machine. So, every time we tell the story, It, the story is rewritten in the brain. So every time we re retell the story, replay the story in the mind, it is rewritten. So, so, in a way, testimony is like a very fragile thing that, you know, testimony, it's never the fixed thing that happens, like that can be played like a machine every time the same story. No, no, it's like every time, it's more natural that every time people tell slightly different stories according to who you are talking to and according to what kind of, you know, image you have in your mind. And it, it can change all the time. So we are not human, we are not the machine, and this is very fragile, and this is very like a, Like ambiguous, it's not, it's not machine. So, so how we remember, how we retell the story, how we tell the story is we're human, so it's 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 different every time we 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 speak, and then all, and then again, it's this experience one to one experience is always is more, it's 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 richer. And somehow, but somehow, as a video artist who is dealing with this history, I have to somehow find a way to deliver the emotion or deliver the story in some other way, not the, the same way, but through these media, s I try to find a way to tell it in a different way. So that's what I've been doing in a Japanese context for the last 10 years. And then I was asked to come uh, to, uh, to, by Tobias to come to Miami and to make a project. So I thought, okay, what can I do in this context? And when I first came, actually, I asked、uh, him that I want to go to gun range. And so they arranged <laughs> me to go to gun range <laughs> because for me, like, for as, a, as a non US person, to come in US, and I feel like, okay, here you're allowed to have a gun. <laughs> so I get scared. So I, and then I, so I wanted to see like, how, how is it is like to go there and, you know, To shoot a gun because I've never experienced to, of holding, even holding the gun. And so I asked、uh, the museum to take me to the <laughs> gun range, and I went there, and I was like, wow, was, I had to, yeah, I was so scared to even just to hold this gun. <laughs> and the shooting was very scary, but I, also I was so scared that other people, there are other people, total st strangers, i s firing the gun next to you. and、uh, How, how is it possible? How can you trust this person? You know, I was like, amazed by,、uh, by the whole,、uh, yeah, by the whole, whole、uh, experience. So, these are the first stage of my, my,、uh, my research. And then, little by little, I thought, okay, in the US,、uh, so the, the, the memories that I've been dealing with were like 70 year old memories from World War II. 
And so I thought in the, if I work m to make a work in the US, maybe I can do something more present. And so I, wanted, I thought I, okay, I want to make a work with soldiers or veterans from recent wars. So I asked uh, Tobias to, uh, that, uh, that I want to meet some uh, veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan. And then Tobias, and the uh, museum found, found uh, uh, several people. So I did interview and I heard their stories. And at first I didn't, ha I have no clue. But little by little, I start to understand the, the uh, people's situation. And then, uh, yeah, and then a lot of things were quite similar to what I heard from, uh, what I read and what I heard from, from, uh, war, from people from World War II. But a lot of other things are very uh, specific about the US. And also, and I learned so much. And the one experience I had, for example, I had, I met a woman soldier who lives uh, near Miami, and me and Tobias, we went there, we went to her house to hear her story. And she was a mechanic, and she became, a, she decided to become a soldier right after 9-11. She was a high school, what, as she finished in high school, she decided, okay, 9-11 uh, happened, and then she thought, okay, I'll become a soldier. And she was a mechanic, and she was in Iraq, uh, quite early stage of the, of the war, she was a mechanic, and she went, she went there, and she said, you know, she didn't fire a gun or anything. She, she didn't even, you know, she, wasn't, she was not in, in the front line, let's say, but she was always in the base, fixing the track, and, you know, doing the mechanical things. And, but she said, you know, from time to time, they got shot from, shot by the, they got attacked by the rockets. So that's like, a, and also she, they always have to be aware that there are like bombs, IEDs everywhere. So they have to be alert, aware that something might be uh, the bomb. But she said, you know, she didn't have like, this experience of like s soldier in the, in the war field, you know, shooting and, you know, getting hurt, get shot or losing limbs. So she said like, you know, but, but, she, but she, She's very much uh, still, uh, it's been more than 10 years she's, she came back and she's still very much, uh, you know, how do I say, like destroyed. She's, she's having a hard, hard time. And, and she says, uh, like, um, I didn't go to, no, no, I, I didn't have, no, I, I have like, you know, all, I have arms and I have, I'm fine and I didn't even, I was not even there and I didn't, I have my life. So she feels that she, she's not enough to have a PTSD. But, but, as an, but it's quite obvious that she, she, she's very troubled. She, yeah, as we speak, she starts crying and all that. It's very painful to hear her story. And so I realized that, okay, it's not, about like a, it's not only about killing somebody or getting hurt, losing limb, but it's... I, come to understand that maybe we are, it probably, I'm sure it depends on person who you are, but for most of us, or I, I, I would think that uh, we are not so strong, you know, we are not as strong as we think we are, we wish we are, and so uh, just being in, in, in Iraq or Afghanistan for one, one year, and then your whole system is, 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 is rewritten and it's become something totally different. And when you're back, you become a different person and they suffer a lot to readjust themselves in a society and also readjust themselves if they become a veteran, if be, they, when they quit becoming a soldier, then they have to readjust themselves to the image of like a normal life. Because they, before they were like soldier, they have to be strong, they have to, be ready to, you know, do things. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I'll, uh, now I, so I, I show my work. Uh, so I'm not sure if you have seen the work there in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the gallery, but this is the work uh, that I made. It's called Battle Land. So what I asked, uh, so with, I worked with five veterans, uh, and uh, I asked, uh, you know, this GoPro camera, I asked them to wear the GoPro camera, and I asked them to, uh, 
to describe their uh, daily uh, setting, like uh, everyday life, with wearing this GoPro. And in the same place, I asked them to go back to the memory space. And I asked them, let's say, like, can you go back to the most stressful moment of your time in Iraq or Afghanistan? And so in the same setting, they, exp st with, a, with, with actually with their eyes closed, they have to explain that what happened, what, what, they, what, what they experienced. And, and I took these two kinds of uh, videos and I put them together in editing and created this, uh, it's 41, 40, no, 42 minutes long uh, video. Uh, but I just show uh, some parts of it. Uh, maybe, okay, I just show. Can you put the volume up? Okay. Are you blindfolded? All right. This is my home. This is the entrance to my home. No shoes in my house. So I have everyone put their shoes here. This is my dining room. I don't use it much. Not as much as I should. In here is my kitchen, slash laundry room. I do my laundry over here, and I wash my dishes over here. It's my drying rack, where I wash my dishes. Every morning, I make my coffee here. I have to have my coffee. This is where I cook. I can hear sergeants yelling, get out the truck, get out the truck. The flames are coming close to me and the heat's getting very strong. I'm trying to get my seatbelt off, but I'm stuck in my strap. And I ripped my seatbelt off, my bathroom. Come here every morning. This is where I like to relax and, and I feel the smoke so heavy in there. And finally I get the door open and I roll out onto the pavement. And I'm in the gunner's hatch. And all of a sudden I hear a loud hissing sound. This is where I sleep. This is my bed. This is where I sleep. And I can just feel the smoke and the heat against my face. Um, so to my left, I've got a uh, small little dock um, with jet skis and boats. I've got the intercoastal uh, waterway in front of me. I've got uh, the walkway going north and palm trees everywhere. Uh, in front of me, I have Star Island, which is one of three islands in, uh, which is where the movie stars and the athletes and the musicians all have houses and beautiful boats and palm trees and mansions. Uh, I hear to my left side the whistle, the and up ahead of me. 
And my first thought was thank you that it was not closer to me. But, and then my second thought is, oh my God, I hope everyone's okay over there. I hope it missed everybody. I hope no one's hurt. Um, there were no secondary explosions, so I know that it didn't hit a plane or a vehicle um, or a gas tank or something like that. And there's nothing I can do about it right this second. But as soon as I can, I want to see if I can go help anyone that needs help over that way. That wasn't my job, but that was the camaraderie and the brotherhood and fellowship of the military that was in all of us. What I see in front of me is a concrete and sandbag bunker. There's three bodies to one side and there's three bodies to the right. And on the left side, uh, we get to so this third soldier. So I have soldier. so many different stories and, from, um, told by uh, veterans, and there are so many that but I and, um, had to edit it to, uh, the head to fit the in body like 41 minutes. So it's facing and, uh, this way. Uh, and it's, it's in a fetal position. Yeah, the body uh, is about... Yes, it's like... A, a, Today we have one veterans here. Is Freddy here? Freddy is not here. Uh, we have uh, Getulio. There's Getulio. He's one. He's one person that who uh, did participate in the project, and uh, his his scenes is very painful to uh, to hear and also to include in the work. But it's it's there. Uh, it, it takes it needs time to watch it, so I don't show it now in this okay in this situation. But, but what I learned from especially from from uh, Getulio is that you know we have this thing called a trolley problem. Probably people know this trolley problem. Do you know this that the trolley is coming? It's like a, this is a kind of psychological test and to test your moral value or like ethical uh, value of, uh, of a human being. And trolley is coming, and there are five people there, or, or, and then there's another lane, and there's one person there, and the train is, like, is coming very fast, and you, have a, you are in the position of to, how do you say, there. You can change the direction of the, where the train trolley goes, and then if trolley goes straight, then five people get killed, and if you, change the direction, then only one person get killed. And which do you do it? And this is a kind of a test that uh, and people has to, uh, has to answer that, okay, I, you know, I, uh, I, cannot do the, I cannot change the direction, so I just let it go. And, or some people say, oh, no, no, I change, I change it so that one person dies, but you know, five others survives. So this is like a test that uh, scholars come up with, and then they, uh, they have all sorts of variation, and they talk about uh, how our ethical value, e ethics works and all that. But, uh, but this is just, uh, you know, the test that we do uh, uh, in, in, on paper. And we just have to imagine the situation, and we just do it. But I think that soldiers in, 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 in the battlefield, like, uh, like uh, Getulia's case, uh, too, a lot to do with Getulia's, life is that they really have to be in this situation in the real life. And the choice is whether you pull the trigger to kill the person or you don't do it. And this is a kind of choice that they have to make every day. And every day we have to make a choice of whether we eat rice or bread or take this road and take that road. This is a kind of choice that we have to make every day. But in there, every day they have to make a choice whether Take take life take a life of this person or not, and if they pull the trigger, they will be traumatized. You know, traumatized from this experience of killing another person, killing another human beings. It's not never easy for human being to kill another human beings. So, for the rest of life, this person will be traumatized to do this. And also, if they don't do it. That's also, they'll be traumatized from this experience. They didn't do it. They feel like they failed to do what they are supposed to do. They are soldier. They are supposed to, supposed to, you know, supposed to uh, protect their friend, their like uh, their their people, and 
and there's, if there's a risk, they have to, they have to make a decision to, to pull the trigger to, to neutralize the, the situation. And if they don't do it, then again, they have to, they feel like they failed. So this is a kind of situation that this is like a, you know, this is on paper, but I, I, I learned that people, soldiers, they have to live in this kind of a situation every day. And that's, that's the condition that uh, soldiers are in. And um, it's not, this is not our everyday life. And so I'm sure that it's not so, it's not easy to come back to, you know, making small choices, like uh, everyday choices. And uh, so I understand that, it, yeah, it's, uh, it's very hard. Yeah, fr from ex people, uh, veterans uh, that I worked with, they're so warm, so welcoming, and so, you know, they're super nice people, but also everybody has experienced some, I, yeah, it was also that it was a very difficult project because it's, the problem is still, still uh, ongoing. It's, it's, not, it's not solved at all, and for some of them it's still very difficult to readjust themselves in the society. So, uh, so, that's, that, so what, what can I do with my art is always a question. And I don't know if I, my art is, uh, is, yes, art, I believe that art is one way to kind of, let's say like this PTSD or the situation in soldier, of the soldier, all these things are very complex. It's very complicated. It's never like a simple story. It's very, uh, very complex stories. And art, art is one way to, one way that we can deal with this complexity without simplifying it, but it still can make it visible or more tangible in the form of, of let's say, in my case, video installation, or in some other cases, painting, or, or you know, we believe that, I believe that we, we can still try to, we can still, we can do still do things, and yeah, and let's say, it's very, the situation always is very complicated, very complex, but we somehow crystallize this, this complicated uh, situation into, into artwork. And, and artwork, I, through artwork, I, I, I want to share what's, what the, the emotions and, and the difficulties to, to, to more people uh, through my artwork. That's like how I want things to happen through my artwork, but if I succeed it or not, is not quite sure yet, because I just finished making it, I just finished editing it, and I have to ask uh, people like Getulio and others whether, or how, how their experience was, and if it didn't help them, then I have to th rethink about my practice. But, uh, yeah, so I'm, I don't know the clear answer of what I'm doing, but at least I, I ho yeah, I'm hoping that that helps people and hoping that it helps us to understand their situations. Um, and that's, yeah, that's, that's just my hope. So uh, I think I, I just, I finish it here and just, yeah. Is it okay? <laughs> okay. Also, thank you very much for uh, li listening. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Sh sure. Uh, uh, hello. Um, hello. My, my question was about the veterans that you worked with. Mm -hmm. uh, was there like a confidentiality clause or I was just looking over the, the, um, the handout there that it, it didn't mention their names other than the veteran that's here in attendance. I was just curious about mm -hmm. that, about recruiting them, how you found them also is a question I have. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, their openness to participating. Yes. Uh, how we found them is like through actually museum, also somebody uh, close to the museum who, uh, there's a, a Bernie, a lawyer who works with a uh, day-to-day basis. They, he works with uh, veteran people. 
uh, problem. So he, he knew uh, people, and through him, we first had uh, uh, several people in the museum, and we did interview. And through interviewing them, they introduced me to their friends. So that's how we get into co contact with the veterans. And then some people didn't participate. Some people didn't want to do it. And people who were in the video is like said okay to do it. So some people, for some of them, they say like two years ago, they couldn't have done it. But uh, he, now he can do it. So, so if somebody is really still really destroyed or really having problems, I don't think this person can do it. But still, there are some people that I asked them to do it. And, you know, they have to go back to this space again and again in a, in a shooting. And it's never easy. And, and uh, so, uh, yeah, it's never easy. So I'm asking them to do what pro maybe what they don't want to do. So I want to make sure that they feel comfortable. And after I make the work, I ask them to check it, whether they feel comfortable with what I, how I edited. And I always say, if you f don't feel comfortable with any parts, I can take it out. And so they have right to say, I don't want this part to be used. So after checking this, that uh, and everybody's okay with, with how edited. So that's how, th so they have checked everything. So, yeah. Names? names are in the, in the video, yes, in the video. And in the publication, uh, it was too late. <laughs> publication had to be, the due, due date was like a few weeks ago. <laughs> and the video is just done last week. And then I sent a link to everybody only the last minute to check everything. So I couldn't, you know, uh, check everything. With, so for the publication, I, could, I didn't have time to put all the names there. Yeah, it's very practical. <laughs> Yes, please. Um, I know that a lot of Japanese writers are sort of interested in World War II, and I know you're interested in that too as an artist, um, certainly like Murakami, people like that, um, especially that were born in that era. Um, is, that, is that history sort of still a part of Japanese culture? Are artists still interested in it, it or has it been repressed, sort of? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. It's, it's been repressed a lot. Because it was a, we lost the war, so it was a sh big shame for the for Japanese people. So we repressed too much that now people are afraid that okay they'll be forgotten forever. And the people who has experienced all this war, they are getting too old, very very old now. So the people like a young generation like us, or like a writer like Murakami, or like pe people in general, are a bit afraid that. Maybe we forget about the whole thing completely. And that's why I think people are digging into the history and try to express in, in, uh, in what it, in, in, by uh, what we can do, uh, how we, uh, like by writing or by making videos. <coughs> and also, it's a, it's a, now it's a question that for the last 70 years, we didn't have any army in Japan. We have self-defense force, but uh, uh, w when war f ended uh, in uh, World War II, f when we lost the war, we decided not to have any armed force anymore in Japan because the trauma was too big, destruction was too big, and we killed so many people uh, outside of Japan. So we decided not to have an army. S but, at, but at the time, of course, uh, we had US uh, uh, allied uh, troops all over Japan, so we were okay. But Korean was broke in 1950, and then uh, the, all the troops went to Korean Peninsula, and there was nobody to protect the, the land, so we made an army reserve, police reserve, and then the, that became a self-defense force. So we have self-defense force for the last uh, 65 years, but we don't call it army. And we think that uh, we think that we are peace loving. It's been we didn't ha get in involved in any war. We didn't. Our uh, self defense force didn't kill anyone in the last 70 years, and no troops were d sh were killed in any conflict. Since eight, uh, b the end of the 80s, we sent some troops to a p like a peace 
peacekeeping operation outside of Japan, but still we, we as an, like lightly armed soldiers, like uh, troops. So they have never shot a gun outside of Japan. And that's like, a, that's our like identity that we love peace and you know, we, we are a peaceful country. But of course this is a big fantasy, you know. <laughs> Because the, you know, in the Korea, it's always the war. In North Korea and South Korea, there's a big border, and then there are always troops on both sides. And because this front line was set in the Korean Peninsula, that Japanese people could enjoy the, uh, we we could enjoy the peace, peace. And also, of course, we have so many U.S. Uh, uh, military bases in in Japan, and then we feel like a U.S. military has been saving us, like protecting us. But, uh, but now it's, uh, it's a b very big national debate whether we should, maybe we should call our self-defense force as, as an army and we should protect our land by ourselves. And this is a very big debate uh, lately. Uh, so that's also a part of why we have to think about uh, what happened in World War II. And we always go back to, the, to World War II and, and see, and, to check like what we should do, what should we shouldn't do, and what is our national identity and all that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. And, and thank you, thank you.